It is strange that the FE version of a Samsung phone would be better, but somehow the Samsung S20 just didn't live up to my expectations. That said, I am leaving one key issue out of this intro, but let me tell you about my experience with the Samsung Galaxy S20 and tell you whether or not you should buy this in 2023. Hello everyone, this is Matt from Real World Review, and let me show you the phone from the other side of the world. Let's get started. So the main issue that I have seems to be a big one. This is not the Samsung S20 5G, because this is the G980F, which the 0 means that it's 4G, and the F generally means that it is a dual SIM or Exynos version, which is not sold in the US. This is one of technically four variants. There's two that are sold globally, one that's 4G and one that's 5G, and then there's two sold in the US, one that is 5G and one that is ultra wideband 5G, which Verizon supports. And because you have it on Verizon, now you lose SD card support and four gigabytes of RAM for some reason. The RAM aspect, however, is nothing different from this phone because this one only has eight gigabytes of RAM rather than the 12 gigabytes that the US versions generally have. We do get the option to add virtual RAM, which totals 16 gigabytes, but I never really had a RAM issue in the first place. Either way, the issue is that this Exynos version is just bad. So make sure that when you do buy this phone, you stick with the US version. Having recently reviewed the Samsung S20 FE with the Qualcomm 865 chip, I can easily tell you that the Exynos 990 found in this phone is just bad. I noticed with normal usage, this phone just gets hot and uncomfortable to touch, which is not something that I normally explain. Phones naturally get warm, and people consider that overheating, for some reason. People love to complain about OnePlus devices overheating, but that's just not true in under 80 degree temperatures. The phone shot up to 60 degrees Celsius on the processor, which is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. In comparison, my computer is sitting at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit while typing up this video, and will get to about 140 degrees or higher when editing a video. This phone gets to that when scrolling through Google Play Store. Then performance is noticeably worse, being closer to the Snapdragon 855 or Samsung S10 rather than the Snapdragon 865, which is what the S20 US versions have. Graphics also take a decent drop, so don't expect graphic intensive games to play well, but do expect that the phone will get uncomfortably hot to hold. Then the battery life is just terrible. I tested it out and thought maybe the battery was just old, so I put in a new one, use it for a week, and literally no difference. I change the refresh rate to 1080p at 60Hz, and it still drains through the day, almost 30% a day from not even using the phone. I actually did test it, and it was about 20% overnight. And this is a non-5G phone with a 4000 milliamp cell. I can still make the phone last through the day, and even using basic apps like YouTube gives me decent battery life, but I can't see this coming close to 3 hours of screen on time, even with the new battery. Then there's the obvious issue for this one being that it doesn't even support 5G. But I do have to remind you that if you do buy the Snapdragon or US version of this phone, this whole section doesn't really apply. Sure, battery life wouldn't be perfect, but expect a 10-30% to 30 battery life increase, and judging by Geekbench 5, about a 4 to a staggering 20% performance increase when compared to the US version. Not to mention that the US version was $999 brand new, and the global 4G only version in the UK was over a thousand US dollars when new. So we always get the best versions of the phone for the cheaper prices. I can't even believe that this phone was actually a thousand dollars brand new in 2020. Now honestly, that's where the downsides end. For the rest of the video, it's pretty much going to be the same as the Snapdragon version, so when you're buying a phone, make sure that the model number starts with G981. We can start with the frame, and then the next section will go back into the phone. The back of the phone is where you get the curved glass being Gorilla Glass 6, capable of breaking and scratching, so take that with a grain of sand. Or maybe don't, because that might scratch it. Camera area is a curious one, showing off those three cameras, a flashlight, and a hole for the microphone. Besides the Samsung logo, that's pretty much it, and makes the back look kind of boring or generic nowadays. Moving to the aluminum frame, the top is where we find the hole for the microphone and SIM card tray. That has a few variations. Generally, the tray will support one or two SIMs, which allows for an SD card only if you use one SIM. The Verizon one is rude, only allowing for a single SIM and no SD card, and they only have 8GB of RAM for some reason. The left side is, well, nothing. While the right side is where the volume and power buttons are, the first S phone to put them in the right area. Nice. The bottom is where the microphone is, as well as the USB-C 3.1 port. The six ovals are where the loudspeaker sits, and pairs with a small slit at the top of the screen to give us stereo speakers, but the bass is lacking. 
while we are here, we have that beautiful 6.2 inch 1440p 120 hertz OLED display that sits here, only it isn't. The issue is you get 60 hertz at 1440p while 1080p is at 120 hertz. And yes, I tried both and the battery life is no different, so choose which one you want. Regardless, images and videos look spectacular on the screen, even though there is a little hole punch for the front camera. Brightness is nice at about 400 nits, but auto brightness can bring this over 800 nits. The screen is slightly curved, but it's not that bad, really. This is protected by Gorilla Glass 6 as well, and hides the ultrasonic fingerprint scanner. I will admit that it is fairly accurate, but also pretty slow. We do have face unlock as a backup, though. With this screen, we get the double tap to wake and sleep, as well as the always on display, all which probably help drain the battery quicker. Fantastic screen, but there are some limitations. Speaking of limitations, ads suck. Waiting sucks too. For $2 a month, you can join the membership and not only get new RWR videos as soon as I make them, but also ad free. And yes, that includes this little ad right here. Now that the ad is done, enjoy more video. Going inside, like I said, there are a few options. This one is powered by the Exynos 990, while the US version has the Snapdragon 865 chip. They both run Android 13 and do it well, with the 865 getting the upper hand, just like it does having 12GB of RAM over the 8GB on the Exynos and Verizon versions. All models come with 128GB of UFS 3.0 storage, though memory cards are supported, with the Verizon one, again, lacking the slot for that card. Running apps, you're not going to really notice too many issues. The Snapdragon one is technically faster, but that doesn't mean that the Exynos version is useless, giving me no issues when it comes to waiting for apps to load or function properly. Or, you know, not too much. This runs Android 13, but don't expect it to get Android 14. Not officially, at least. Like I said, the battery is a 4000 milliamp cell with varying battery life, but all these phone versions allow for 25 watts of wired charging as well as up to 15 watts of wireless charging and wireless power share to charge your buds and awkwardly charge phones. This phone probably won't last all day for heavy usage on the Exynos versions, but will charge at decent speeds. While this isn't the smallest phone coming in at 5.97 inches tall, it is fairly light at 163 grams. The phone is IP68 dust and water resistant, but let's assume that those seals aren't as good as they are, and take that claim with a grain of rice. We get varying 4G and 5G support depending on which models you have, but they all get Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0 support. The performance aspect of this phone will be more than enough for most people, especially if you grab the smart choice, which is the non-Verizon US version. Now this part stays positive because the cameras are the highlight of this phone for me. There are three cameras on the back and one on the front. The front is a focusable 10 megapixel sensor which allows for quality shots as well as 4K video up to 60 frames per second, making this a good phone for vlogging of all sorts. Then on the back we get a 12 megapixel main sensor while the telephoto sensor is a 64 megapixel camera that allows for clearer three times shots that feels like it's actually cropping into the sensor. It's actually pretty interesting. Either way, this allows for a decent range for the cameras, all while providing optical stabilization and accurate colors and lighting. The last sensor is a 12 megapixel ultra wide, which looks pretty good and matches the quality and color from the other sensors. As for video, we get 4K 60 frames per second out of the main camera and the front camera only, which is strange while 30 frames per second can shoot on all cameras. We also get 8K at 24 frames per second, which only shoots on the 64 megapixel telephoto sensor, obviously, though it doesn't look that good. But what do I know? I'll let you look at some of the media that I shot with this phone, so enjoy.
Honestly, I love the camera set on here. I thought that the age of the phone and the fact that it's a non-ultra would make this camera set look dated, but the cameras hold it pretty well. This definitely surprised me. After using this phone, I'm torn. It is a boring yet exciting phone, as most Samsung phones are. You know what you're going to get, and it's hard for me to pull on your strings and convince you to buy or not buy this phone. I love the screen, cameras, and performance of this phone, but I can be honest and say that the phone doesn't look interesting. The operating system is so practical. It doesn't take any risk or really force us into using gimmicky features, but rather gives us what we need, and that's about it. For those looking for a good phone, the Samsung Galaxy S series is a good option. The S20s can be found around the $200 area, but I would pick up the S20 FE at that price, especially if you need a bigger phone. You do lose some camera quality by doing that, but the size and the battery boost might be worth the trade-off to you. I like using this phone, even if the Achilles heel is that it's powered by Samsung, so it's easier for me to move from this one. But if you're looking at a Snapdragon version of this phone, it's definitely worth considering. And that's my review of the Samsung Galaxy S20, the weird cookie cutter phone. But what do you think? Do you agree that Exynos processors are really bad? Let me know what you think, and as always, thanks for watching.